Back in the days, multi-threading was scary. It was necessary to take care of everything yourself. Thread pools, synchronization, data races, and so on. Nowadays, the standard has made things much more easy. And the normal use cases are quite straightforward. That's why today I will show you an easy method to use multi-threading. Standard async. Additionally, we will dive a little bit deeper in uh, how standard async is implemented and explore how the threads below it work. I have created here a small app, which is at its current place only measuring and displaying the frame rate. So let's, let's look. Uh, we do have a startup function, which is basically filling the frame rates two, of the 200 last frames. And in our update function of the app, there is nothing more than just measuring the last frame rate and discarding one of the frame rates that already has been measured. So here we just get the time of the frame and use it to fill the frame rate. And then after that, we just plot um, all of the frame rates and we generate a graph which is showing the last frame rates. So we have later a better understanding of the data that we want to display and also of how the multi-threading will work with our frame rates. So if we build this here, um, we can just compile here the code of this application and then we can dive a little bit deeper and look the result. So we see here we have uh, the frame weight of the last 200 frames and we see it's jittering a lot around a little bit, but on average we can say it's around about 30 FPS. So if you think I deserve a better PC, uh, hit like and probably I can afford a better PC someday soon. Um, but overall, it's uh, just a little bit fluctuating. The first thing we need for multi-threading is something that you can actually multi-thread. So we need a calculation, which is really doing some work and we will add it here at the source code and we will return a bool just because we can and we call it my calculation and let's always return true at this point and inside we just do a little for loop which is iterating all over the place so we create the volatile um, and it's volatile because we don't want the compiler to optimize it out because otherwise this calculation is pretty much useless and then we say something like uh, we want to iterate probably something like 10 million times um, and then we just increment x in the loop so this is now a function that is creating a little bit of load on the processor and then what we want to do next is introduce a little bit of functionality that we can actually call this function in our app code so what we need to do is we will introduce three different pools for checkboxes where we actually can um, do the calculation or not. So we call this uh, bool calculate. We start with false, we call it bool async. We also do this one false. And the last one, bool thread. We also make that one false. So let's make this as something that is multi threaded because we already have introduced here the flags, we can then say we want to do it in async. And now we need to write here the code that is actually doing all of this in parallel. In order to do that, uh, we need to include some important things, which is um, the future. Future is a concept in programming that is referring to a value that doesn't yet exist but let, let me explain this is the code which will do our multi-threading so we do have here a future of type bool which means that eventually it will return a bool and we initialize it using the so-called standard async and the, st the standard async is basically a thread and a function wrapper which is doing the calculation somehow in the background and you don't really know how and it's also implementation defined and you don't really care 
And that's the really cool thing about standard async. You can give it some hints, but what happens beneath the surface, it's none of your business and you also don't need to care. The only thing that you need to do is you need to give standard async the function that it needs to call, which in this case is my calculation. And then later, if you have retrieved the future, which is here future1.get, um, you need to call this function dot get because uh, the dot get is working as a synchronization barrier. So at this point here, where the point get or the dot get get is called, it will wait until the underlying calculation of async has been finished. And you don't need to do anything else than just calling dot get and let the standard library do its magic because we have here created a second future concurrently to the first one before calling get both of these futures here can be calculated in the background concurrently so if the compiler and the standard library sees fit and they think that you can gain something by doing this here multi-threadedly then it will actually do it you can give it here a little bit of a hint that you want to do this asynchronously. You could also choose here deferred, which means that as soon as you call .get, the function is calculated. But the hint here with async is that we want to immediately start calculating in the background. However, it's not, um, yeah, it's not 100% sure that it actually will start calculating in the background. So there is some freedom in the implementation behind it, but nonetheless, um, it's a good hint and usually it will also do the thing that you want to do. To retrieve the result, we just call this dot get and um, the return value of the function will then be our result. So this code here, if we compile it, let's go here to the console and actually compile it. And now we can run it again and we see that we have here the calculate function, which drops the frame weight immediately. And we have the multi-threaded version, which is a little bit better in terms of frame rate. So here as a second comparison, this was the multi-threaded version and this is the single threaded version. So we see already by just using a little bit of standard async, we can tremendously improve our calculation here because we are calculating stuff in the background. And you see here also the code, it's not too complex. So you have here my calculation and here you need to create the future, which will eventually give you the value of my calculation. And then you need to wait for the future to actually have been completed. So it's not two lines of code, it's four lines of code and already gives you a quite a big improvement. The necessary thing though, is that these my calculations, they are independent from each other. So it's important that my calculation is not somehow depending on the result of this other my calculation. And also there are no side effects involved because otherwise you will run into race conditions or data races or something like that. But what is happening below the surface? Below the surface, standard async is doing nothing more than abstracting. So it's giving you an easy interface to multi-threading, but sometimes this is not enough. Sometimes you need to dive a little bit deeper and to actually know what is implemented because you want to create a little bit more complex multi-threaded architectures. And that's why we have a look here at what is actually happening. The first thing that is actually happening below here is that a task is getting created. So we create here a task and the task is getting the function my calculation. So this is now only a task. It's not doing anything at this point. It's just basically creating an object which is callable and this object also has something that is get future. It's basically the same as the future here. Um, but this time this get future um, is referring to the result of this task. Then 
this task itself needs to be calculated at some point. So I could calculate it here in this thread where I am currently at, or I could push it into a thread pool, I could push it into any thread that I have just created, or wherever I actually want to calculate it. So this is basically where standard thread comes in. Here I create a thread and I move my task object inside this newly created thread. The newly created thread then immediately starts calculating in the background and then I can basically say I want to wait until the thread has uh, finished calculation, which is basically thread.join. And then I can ask the future for its result. So this is basically what is happening below the surface and it's giving me a lot more flexibility in app implementing stuff. So here I have now created two threads which calculate the tasks, but I could also pull threads from a thread pool or I could use some event-driven architecture to reuse a thread which is already there so I don't need to spawn it and so on. So it's giving me really the flexibility that I need to dive deeper and, and solve the problem that I'm currently at hand. And this is the cool thing about the standard library. So I do have here the easy to use interface, which is really, let's say, usable for 80% of the use cases, and it's already giving you tremendous results. And then if you really need to go deeper because you're performance critical or whatever, then you have the opportunity to do so, to go deeper, to uh, scratch below the surface and to implement stuff based on more low-level features. Now let's also here check this one out, compile it, compile how the thread ver or compare how the thread version um, is comparing with the async. So we have here again the frame rate. Uh, as a comparison, this is the normal calculation. This here is the asynchronous calculation with standard async. And this is the asynchronous calculation with standard thread. And we see here between async and thread, there's not really a difference at this point because I have implemented basically the same thing again. I could make the thread version a little bit more performant by using something like a thread pool or by not creating the threads but reusing threads that are already there and so on. But this is going a little bit too deep for today. Now a common thing where usually people struggle a little bit is if they have a member function that they want to calculate here. Because right now, my calculation, it's just a free function. It's not associated with any class. But if I move this now into uh, my class, then I suddenly have a member function and I need to use a little bit of a different syntax. So firstly, make this one const because it's not really changing any member of the class and it's good style to, I actually say that it's not doing that. And now I can not use my calculation here like that. This normal call stays the same, works, but here my calculation at this point needs um, additional information about the object that it's actually being called on. So I need to use the function pointer syntax, which is in this case my app, because the class here is called my app. And additionally, I need to pass the this pointer because um, it is needing the object that it shouldn't call the function from. This is all that you need to do to adapt it for the use case of async. For the use case of the more low-level implementation for the tasks, it is uh, a little bit more tricky. Here you need to use standard bind. Standard bind is binding the object and the function together in a nice and easy syntax. So we're using here standard bind and then we use the syntax of uh, the function pointer of the class and we bind it together with the, this pointer. If you want to use standard bind, um, usually it is also somewhere in, in exactly those includes that you need also for the multi-threading because it's quite used uh, heavily in this multi-threading context. 
And you see, if I now compile it, um, it shouldn't be a problem. And it will work just like before. Um, so I now have basically not a free function, but a function which belongs to my class. And we see here we can again do like the calculations in a threaded or an asynchronous way or just a single way, which is then tremendously slowing me down. So yeah, today I've shown you um, basic multi-threading in C++. It is useful for about 80% of the cases and usually it gets the job done pretty well. It is far from perfect. So if you need to really do more complex stuff, you need to dive a little bit deeper. And um, you, if you really want to squeeze out the last bit of performance, I advise you to look into thread pools and to look into proper data synchronization um, and so on. But for let's say 80% of the use cases, this is really a no brainer and it's really easy and straightforward to use. So that's all for today. I hope that you have learned something. Fire up your machine and clone the code. And as always, enjoy coding. The first thing we need for multithreading is something that you can actually multithread. So we need a calculation, which is really doing some work. And we will add it here at the source code and we will return a bool just because we can. And we call it my calculation. And Let's always return true at this point. And inside we just do a little for loop, which is iterating all over the place. So we create the volatile um, and it's volatile because we don't want the compiler to optimize it out because otherwise this calculation is pretty much useless. And then we say something like uh, we want to iterate probably something like 10 million times. Um, and then we just increment x in the loop. So this is now a function that is creating a little bit of load on the processor. And then what we want to do next is introduce a little bit of functionality that we can actually call this function in our app code. So what we need to do is we will introduce three different pools for checkboxes where we actually can um, do the calculation or not. So we call this uh, bool calculate. We start with false, we call it bool async. We also do this one false. And the last one, bool thread. We also make that one false. 